Hi, my name is Greg Benfield. In this presentation, I'm going to talk you through some key theoretical ideas about assessment and feedback relevant to teaching in university. I leave you to think about how to interpret these ideas in relation to your own context, by which I mean the subject you teach, the department and institution that you're in, and even whether or not your course is delivered primarily face to face or substantially online. These are the intended learning outcomes for the session. It's really a foundation for a second session that examines some of the current issues in assessment and feedback and focuses on some practical issues for teaching. There's an extensive bibliography on assessment and feedback in the course Moodle site that you can consult if you want to pursue any of these ideas in more detail. Okay, so let's start off with something very fundamental about assessment. These quotes express a very fundamental understanding about the role of assessment in student learning. We know from our experience, from extensive research on the issue, that strategic students will pay careful attention to those aspects of the course that they know or believe will be assessed. And they're likely to ignore those aspects they believe will not be assessed. One of the conclusions we can draw from this is the one in the third quote. Namely, assessment can be an incredibly powerful lever for changing not just what, but how students learn. There are several important theoretical concepts in the domain of assessment. One of these is the idea of assessment validity. Put simply, an assessment tool or task can be thought to be valid if it measures what it purports to measure. But achieving assessment validity can be problematic. Certain tools or techniques may be inappropriate for measure certain kinds of learning outcomes. For example, a multiple choice test which only allows students to select responses from a set of predetermined choices can't assess things like creativity. Sometimes the issue is less clear-cut than this. For example, although in theory it's possible to test problem-solving ability in an examination, frequently it's not problem-solving ability that is tested in examinations, but more students' capacity to correctly identify the features of a problem that they've solved before and then correctly apply the relevant procedures to this version of it. Not so much creative problem solving then as recall and comprehension. The quotes here by educational researchers express these ideas as having been a problem inherent within the system for a long time and one that we're still grappling with. Constructing valid assessment is both important and tricky. And for the assessment designer, it requires absolute clarity about the intended learning outcomes that are to be assessed. To follow through on this idea, I want to remind you of the principle of constructive alignment. Constructive alignment is a framework formulated by John Biggs, founded on constructivist notions of how students learn. The basic idea is very simple. Intended learning outcomes, activities that students do in order to learn those outcomes, and assessments that they do to help judge whether they've learned those outcomes, should all be mutually supportive or well aligned. In short, constructive alignment is about three-stage course design. Be clear and explicit about the desired learning outcomes. Design learning activities for students to do that inculcate the student behaviours you're trying to encourage and that will be sufficient for them to learn the intended outcomes. And thirdly, design assessment tasks that are both valid for assessing the desired outcomes and are likely to encourage students to engage with the desired learning activities. Okay, let's move on to a, another important theoretical concept in assessment. This is the notion of reliability. Reliability concerns the extent to which assessments are consistent. At a very simple level, this should mean that if you design, say, a quiz to measure students' ability to solve some uh, mathematical procedure, like solving equations, then things like the time of administration of the test, 
the location of the test, who marks the test, should not make any difference to students' performance. Furthermore, the test should be internally consistent, which is to say that if a student gets a particular item correct, then any other equivalent items, they should get correct as well. Now, a big problem in higher education concerns the notion of intermarker reliability. Much of our marking involves expert judgments that to a greater or lesser extent are subjective. Frequently, student work in the same course is graded by multiple assessors. As you can see from these quotes, and I should say that despite their age, the problem continues to this day, measured variations between marks given by individual assessors on the same piece of work can be extreme. In fact, in this Newstead and Dennis study, there was greater variation in marks by external markers than by internal members of the department. One of the me mechanisms that we use to manage this problem is internal moderation of marks. Usually a pretty sizable sample of student work, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent often, is taken and shared around for others to mark. If the two markers agree, fine, and if not, they discuss reasons for their differences and try to reach agreement, sometimes appealing to a third marker. Now this moderation process is a formal one that seeks to provide students with a fair and transparent assessment process. But it also con contributes to the development of what we might call an assessment community of practice within a department, in which regular discussion about student work and about standards contributes to a shared understanding of standards within that community. So, although we're unlikely ever to entirely remove subjectivity and variation between individual markers, there are a number of studies that show surprisingly high levels of intermarker reliability in departments that support high levels of informal discussion about student work. Or to put it another way, departments whose members talk to each other especially about learning and teaching, are far more able to develop shared assessment standards than those with relatively impoverished interactions between their members. As you can see on this slide, there is another implication or important implication uh, of this idea for student learning. And that is, if students are to get anywhere close to the same kind of understanding of assessment standards as their markers hold, then it's important for them to be involved in the marking process as well. Perhaps um, by marking exemplar pieces of work and by giving each other feedback on pieces of work. I'll say more about that in the second session. Finally, let me make one brief comment about one last important concept in assessment that I've already raised. This is the notion of fairness. Reliability is related to the idea of fairness because an assessment would clearly be unfair if two students with the same level of achievement obtain different marks. More generally, assessments need to be fair in the sense that they should only discriminate on the basis of students' ability to do the tasks in which they're being assessed. It's unfair if things like cultural background, language, disability, economic and social background and so on could substantially affect results on a test or assignment. That said, it's not really simple or black and white. So, for example, it might be in some circumstances perfectly appropriate to tr treat grammatical errors more leniently if they are made by a non-native English speaker than by a native one. Okay, that's the end of this session. As I mentioned at the start, there's a second session on assessment that deals with some current issues in assessment and feedback.